Good afternoon. Welcome to the Collins Computing webcast featuring GP 2013. Before we get started, we just wanted to remind you that Convergence has now been open for registration. It is March 18th through 21st of next year. It is in New Orleans this year. And we really see a benefit when companies send at least one of their employees to the event so that they can come back and share all of the tips and tricks that they've learned out of the sessions and possibly even modules that you can take advantage of within your current system that will help streamline your processing. So today we're going to cover some of the items that are coming out of GP13 such as the expected release dates, some of the announcements around it, the differences in the pricing, the system requirements, and of course the details of what the enhancements are. We will be demoing most of my favorite features and some of the other consultants, so let's get started. First of all, my Microsoft Dynamics GP 2013 is due to be released sometime in December. Our expected date seems to be somewhere around December 13th. When this system does get released, we'll be testing the code with various add-on products, such as the McCormick Micker Checks and some of the Smart Fill and other modules that most of our clients have, along with the modifications that we've made to the system for our clients and along with reviewing any blogs and community posts so that we're aware of any issues that have come up or any workarounds that our users need to be aware of. We'll be posting many videos about GP 2013 on our YouTube channel, so I encourage you to go take a look out in YouTube, looking up the Collins Computing Channel and seeing the videos. And here I've shown a few of the ones that we already have available to our clients. We try to keep these videos under about five minutes in length, with the exception of this video, which is a complete overview of GP 2013. When you move to 2013, there is a new perpetual pricing that will come into play. So when you request your registration keys for 2013, you will have a new set of licensing. Based on what you currently have, you will be grandfathered into various products. We can absolutely go over what your pricing and what your layout will be, and all you have to do is contact your primary account representative at Collins Computing. The first option here is that clients get a starter pack, and the starter pack includes various modules plus three users. So anything within the financial management area and also the management reporter area along with human resources and payroll, direct deposit, federal magnetic media, and all of the supply chain management basic modules of invoicing, sales order processing, inventory, purchase order processing, and the list that you see here. Now that retails for $5,000. And then if you need some of these other modules, such as the forecaster product, the available to promise or returns management, any of the manufacturing modules, project accounting, or contract administration and the modules listed under it, then you would have the extended pack, which is a retail value of $10,000. On top of that, the additional modules that are available in GP 2013 are the customization pack, which is integration manager and those type of products, Smart List Builder, which includes the Excel List Builder and the Navigation List Builder, and then Extended HR and Payroll, or Collections Management. Now, after you get the Starter Pack or the Extended Pack, you then would license individual users. Now, as I said, with the Starter Pack, you get three users, and then you would add a number of users according to what they need. If the user needs to actually write data, then they're going to need a full user license. If all they need to do is report on data or enter time and expense, they can be a limited user. So for existing customers, we'll take a look at what you currently own. You would get the starter pack, which includes the three users. You would then get the number of users up to what you currently have licensed. 
and then you would either get mapped just to the starter pack or the extended pack. You would then already be grandfathered in to have unlimited human resources and payroll users and unlimited management report designer and viewers. Then you would also automatically get any of the options listed under the customization, smart list builder, or extended if you currently already have those modules. Now your system list price and your annual enhancement will remain the same from year to year. The only time that your list price or your enhancement would change is if you allow it to expire and then it would fall back to the retail list pricing that currently exists and your enhancement would be based on that amount. For Dynamics GP, there are some system requirements that um, are different than in GP10 or 2010. In this release, you are allowed to have a 32 or 64-bit client, so Windows 7 or Vista with a Service Pack 2. It is recommended that you have at least 2 gig of a hard disk space, that you're running MS Office 2010, Internet Explorer 8 or 9, that your ODBC driver is a 10 or 11 compatible, that you do have the Adobe products loaded, and there is also virtual environment support that I don't have the details listed here for, but we would be happy to talk to you about. What is no longer supported in GP 2013 would be clients running an XP version of Windows. The Windows Server 2003 is also not supported. Internet Explorer must be 8 or 9, so not 7. And Microsoft Office 2007 is no longer compatible. The last thing is that the Microsoft SQL Server 2005 is also no longer compatible. So for your server recommendations, again, it can be 32-bit or 64. The SQL Server should be either 2008 or 2012. Microsoft Windows should be either the Small Business Server 2011 or Windows Server 2008. The SQL Reporting Services should be 2008 with Service Pack 1 or 2 or 2012. 8 gigabytes of RAM is recommended. And again, virtual environments are supported in this version, even for the server. Now, if you need to use terminal server or web applications, then here are the requirements. So pretty much the same as what you saw on the server requirements on the previous page, except that the Citrix presentation server needs to be 4.5 or the Citrix N app, and that you should have at least four gigabytes of RAM available and really it shouldn't go above 20 users who are accessing the terminal server at any one time. Otherwise, we recommend an additional terminal server. For the web application that we'll talk about in more detail, um, here are the requirements for that, which is really a lot of the things that I've already listed, except the IIS should be at either 7.0 or 7.5. Now, for GP 2013, Microsoft is releasing feature of the day blog entries and they are very good. They explain each of the modules or each of the features in great detail. And so if you want to get a feed of it automatically, you would just have to enter this information here at the top and create a subscription to the feed. Then you'll see listed in your internet browser these feature of the day listings. And if you click on it, this is the information that you would see. First, you would see why it is cool, and it would go into what this feature is all about. So in this case, I'm showing, and then it'll have a picture of it. So either the form in this case, or a window in some of the changes that have taken place. The last thing is learn it, and it was, it's trying to identify those people in your organization that would probably be able to use this new feature. And this is in kind of a PowerPoint presentation mode. So as you click through these, you'll see the screens go back and forth. So as I said, there are quite a few features to 2013. And here are just a listing of some of the features that have been made available and that we have been testing out already in the beta version. Within GP 2013, there is now a web client which means that your users can access through an HTTP address your information that's in Microsoft Dynamics GP. 
Now, not all modules are available yet. We're in phase one. So here it shows that that's all financials and distribution. Now that does include things like fixed assets and general ledger, payables, receivables, sales order processing, purchase order processing, inventory. So quite an extensive list. What it doesn't include are this HR and payroll, project, field service, or manufacturing modules. As you see here, those are the ones in the red with the expected phases to be coming in at a later date. The other thing that's been updated is the Microsoft Dynamic Management Reporter. Now this is the replacement for FRX. FRX is not compatible with GP 2013, but Management Reporter 2012 is the version of Management Reporter that is compatible with GP 2013. At the moment, the runtime update is up to number three. So since the release of Management Reporter back last this last March, we've had several releases with extensive updates and there'll be more coming. One thing I did want to mention is that the Professional Services Tools Library has now become available to all of our clients and that is a free offering. The only thing that you would pay would be our services to help implement it and train you on these modules. Now some of the things that you would be able to do with this is to modify your general ledger account numbers or your customer IDs or your vendor IDs or even your item IDs. Not only modifying the number but maybe even combining two records or two customer records into one and having all of the transactions come under one customer. So it's a quite extensive list. The ones that I've listed are only the ones that many of our clients have already purchased in the past. And as I said, these products are now available to you for free. It is not only in GP 2013, but also in GP 2010 and GP 10. So if you currently are on those versions and you haven't had us load them, you can, have, um, you can just contact your account manager at Collins and we'll help you coordinate the installation of that. So here's a little preview about the web client that is now. And as you see, I just am showing the top of a transaction with the buttons as it currently appears in Microsoft Dynamics GP. Now, as you'll see on the GP web client, it can't have these drop downs. It has to have a button for each of the areas and those areas will always be in a specific order. So what you'll see is the save and the action buttons that are there in many of the screens will continue there, except the items as like a print icon or some of the go-tos will now also have to be buttons on the menu. These drop-downs that appeared before a file, edit, tools, view, options, again, all of those become buttons on the menu. When we talk about implementing the GP web client, there is some infrastructure that's going to have to be in place before you can use GP on the web. And here's just a little flow chart that kind of shows some of the things that will have to be in place. And our IT staff will be available to work with your IT staff to get these things up and running. So now I'm going to go ahead and show you some of the modifications within the system. You now have the ability to have multi-tenancy which means that you can have multiple versions of Dynamics installed on a SQL Server. Now, a lot of clients don't need that on a continual basis, but when they're trying to do updates and they want to test out a new version when they already have a version in place, this could come into play. Also, for clients who are hosted, the hosting vendor will now be able to have multiple versions of Dynamics for various clients on the same machine. And so this is just going through some of the questions that will now be asked that were not asked in the past. You also will be defining which of your databases are actual just sample companies, that they're not true live companies. So here are the changes that have come into place for really everybody as they log into the system. And most of these are our favorite. So first you'll see the home page changes will I will go into quite extensively. The other thing is being able to select a printer at the time that you hit print. So now this is going to work like any other Windows product. 
and that when you hit print you'll get an option to change your printer and I'll be showing you that. There's some extensive user setup changes. There's also the assignment of alternate reports to make it easier for the system administrators to control those. And then there's also the ability to print SSRS reports from all of the forms. So when you go in and do account maintenance or checkbook maintenance or customer maintenance, all of these modules now have the ability when you say print to actually print an SSRS report. So I talked about the home page changes. The first change is that you can select the number of columns that you want to appear on your home page, which I will show you. And then when you focus in on a particular area, you can actually tell the system where you want the rest of the menu options to show, whether you want the stack of those to show at the top, the bottom, the right, or the left. And here's a picture showing a focus on this area with the stacking here at the right. And then here I'm in the sales module area with transactions as the focus and the other options of menus at the bottom. This is the one that shows the print dialog with the change of, hey, now I want to print, but look, I get to select a printer from within Dynamics. It's not now just my default printer. That includes sending it to a PDF if you have a PDF writer. I told you in the beginning that the pricing for full versus limited users is now different. So when you create a user, you're going to identify whether that user is a full user or if they're limited just to inquiry and then the time and expense reporting. Is this user active, inactive, or just a lesson user, meaning we're just going to be logging into our sample companies and so we don't want it to count as an active user. You can also copy user security now. So as I am identifying one user, I can say where I want to copy the security from with another user. Then you'll see that on the user screen, if I hit the summary button, I can see how many total active full users or active limited users I have in my system, how many are allowed, and then how my users are identified in the system as full or active, or what their status is, whether they're inactive, active, or lesson user. When I identify the modified forms or reports that a user is assigned to, first I assign what ID they use, and then I can identify with each report or each window, whether I'm going to use the Dynamics window or a modified window. Now in the setup screen for this, you now have the ability to mass assign to just the regular Dynamics windows or a modified version, and I can also filter by a series, so I'm not looking at them all at one time. This is just a view of the sales transaction entry screen, both in a normal full access user mode or a GP web client mode. So the fields are the same except the buttons look very much different and some of the arrows like this one for the item number if I wanted to zoom to an item number it now is a tab on this window here at the top. Same thing for the customer detail instead of this little arrow being available I now have a customer detail inquiry tab. Now there are still some arrows available. You'll see here by document number, and I can see more information, by date, by batch. But several of the arrows have now moved up to be a tab. So let's go into the live system and show you as I log in to just first a hosted platform. This is a user that's going to have full access to Microsoft Dynamics GP. It logs me into the hosted server and now I have the option of running GP or running Excel or if I were just a user that only runs GP it could start up GP for me. Otherwise I'm going to double click. I'm going to start up my GP 2013. I can now pick a company that I'm going to log into. Now for this company, I can say always sign on to this company and the screen would no longer appear. But if sometimes I log into one company and sometimes another, I might not want to do that. Now as I log in, you'll see that there are various areas on my window. And I can choose that if I focus by hitting this maximize column, 
then the area that I focus on is now large and the other areas are here listed at the top. Now instead, if I don't want them to be listed at the top, if I don't want them at the right, I can click on right, I can hit OK, and now they'll appear at the right. Or I can choose that I want three columns. So then I can actually fit three columns on each of my areas here. Again, if I focus, the other ones will be stacked. Now if I would like to go to a particular module area like financial, again I can have a focus area or I can have them stacked in threes. I can move them around so if I want transactions always here or maybe I want to put transactions in the middle I can put inquiry over here so I have full, full control of where I want some of these panes to be displayed and it'll remember it for my settings. Now if I very, very rarely use some of these areas, so let's say utilities and down here routines, I can say customize this page and I can unclick routines and utilities and then when I redisplay those areas will go away from my home page here but I can still get to tools, setup, routines or utilities for that area. The other thing that I mentioned is that if you do a print, so let's say that I just pull up any account number and I want to select print and I want to go to a printer, I will now get the question of where would you like it to print. I didn't have to make sure that before I went in the screen I already had my right printer selected and then I can modify it to be whatever printer I want and then go ahead and print. I also wanted to show you what it looked like to log into the web client. So I'm going to go ahead and log in. Again, it's going to default for me. Now this is the same user setup as I had if I was just going to log into the full access screen. It uses the same security for this user so they would be able to get into the same screens as before. Now as I come into the screen I can again focus on particular areas. I can have the areas that I want and remember I took away my routines and my utilities so when I log into the web client it's the same. There are no utilities and routines but I can focus in on an area and have all the rest either at the top or the right or whatever I've selected. Now let's just go ahead and inquire on a screen here in the web client so that you can see that the buttons are a little bit different as I explained. But I still have the ability to zoom down like I do in a GP screen all the way to a source document. And then if I wanted to drill down back into the originating document, I can still do that, just as I can in a normal GP screen. I also have the ability to enter transactions from this screen. It is not only the ability to inquire. So if I go to something like sales, and I go to my sales transaction entry screen, I can go ahead and enter and select a client. I can assign it to a batch. I can add the batch so I have all the flexibility of creating records as I would in the full WebEx or the full client. and I can save the record. So that's just demoing a little bit about the web client. And we'll move on to some of the other modules. So in General Ledger there have been quite a few changes. When you have a general journal batch 
The approval history stays with it, and I'll be showing you that. There are some inquiries for history journal entry numbers, which was not available in the past. There are reconciliation modules for both bank rec and inventory to reconcile against your general ledger. There have been some year-end closing options, both for inactive accounts and for unit accounts. And there are some additional translation calculations available. So the first one I wanted to show you was the general ledger batch history inquiry. If I was creating batches in my system, whether they're general ledger, or payables, receivables, sales or processing, whatever, you have the option of making people get those batches approved prior to posting. And so here shows that I did have an approval on October 24th, and in the past, that was all great. You can have those approvals, but there was not really a way to report on that later. Now you can create a smart list, and I've just added these fields of approval user ID and approval date, and now on my general ledger batches where I've got approvals, I can see who approved and what date those were approved on. The other thing that you can do is inquire on historical journal entries. So in the past, if it was an open year, you could go ahead and put the journal entry in. Otherwise, you couldn't use that screen to do inquiries. You have the option of putting the journal entry in, and if there are multiple entries for multiple years, so if it's like a recurring entry, then it'll default to the newest date, and then you can scroll back, and I will show you an example of that in the live system in a moment. When you close General Ledger Year End, there are a couple extra options. If you don't select those options, then it will work as it does now. And what the system does now is that it will not remove any unused segments in your chart of accounts. So if you've got some account numbers that you've then inactivated and those segments are still there, they will leave them. And it will delete all inactive accounts. That's how the system works now. But here I can say, I want it to remove my unused segment numbers in my chart of accounts by clicking on the little checkbox. And maybe I want to maintain some of my active accounts, and those would be the ones with budget amounts. Or don't delete any of my inactive accounts. So you have those two options. The other nice thing is this little progress bar when you are closing the year. It used to show 50% and then sit there for so long. And now the progress bar actually works and it will tell you how far into the process it is in closing. The other option is with unit accounts. You can choose whether you want those unit accounts to roll forward and act as the, your regular balance sheet accounts or if you want to act as a P&L account and actually clear out the balances. And that automatically happens upon closing on your unit accounts. Some of the great changes that have happened in payables management is that you're able to edit transactions that were 1099 transactions. You can also edit a remit to address, which I'll be showing you, and you can reprint your check stubs and your remittance forms. And there's now an option to print a 1096 form. So for the payables transactions, I mentioned that you can edit a remit to ID. Now that's only if it has not been paid in any way. For 1099 vendors, after you've done transactions in the system, perhaps you've realized that they should have been a 1099 vendor or maybe they were set up as a 1099 vendor and they shouldn't have been. There's now a process window that you can choose to go ahead and update either a vendor only the 1099 transactions or both. And you can say, I want to be changing them from here, not a 1099 vendor, to a particular type of vendor, so dividend miscellaneous, and which box number it should be pointing to. Then you can choose a range of vendors, so by vendor ID, by class, and then you would hit process. You would then get this report that showed you, okay, I changed this vendor, and here are all the transactions they had an old 1099 amount of this, so zero in this case, and now the new 1099 amount. Now it is going to assume that it is a full 1099 transaction. So if you want to modify them individually, you could go ahead and go to the update vendor 1099 screen, pull up a vendor, pull up the transactions, 
and then choose to see just the 1099 debit transactions or all debit or all credit transactions. You can then modify the 1099 amount on those individual transactions. So in the past, you were able to enter the amounts on a summary screen, but it would never be able to calculate those. Now, by changing the transactions, you're able to recalculate your 1099s at any time. The other major change in the payables area is that you can pull up a payables, in this case payment, and recreate a check stub. And that will actually show you that for that check, maybe it paid a bunch of different vouchers, maybe it had a credit, and it would show all of that in this reprint of the check stub. And at the bottom it would show the totals. There are more payables changes, and some people think that some of these changes are worth the upgrade alone. And that's in the area of voiding. So if you do void a check, then at the time that that check was processed, the other documents that were applied will also become unapplied. Also, if you had a credit card that was created in the process, a credit card payment, then when you void that payment, then the vendor's credit card invoice that was created at that time is also voided. There's also some additional options for EFT payments and EFT configurations. So here's one that I was saying we're avoiding a check and it unapplies the documents that were applied at the time. So here if you see that there is this payables payment and $10,000 of it was the invoice, $8,000 was paid by a, a check, but on this side a credit memo was also applied at the same time. And so you'll see if I had reprinted the check remittance that both this 8,000 and 2,000 had been applied. When I void that payment, this will also become unapplied and therefore if you needed to maybe void the voucher, you're able to then void the voucher. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of these enhancements. We're going to log back into GP. So I'm going to go ahead and go to the financial area and I'm going to inquire on the journal entry inquiry screen. And I'm going to pull up a journal entry. I have three, four, five, six. It'll pull up this transaction that was on February 1st. But if I back up to the previous record, you'll notice that in 2015, in November, I had that same transaction. If I back up again, I also had it in August, in May, and in February of 2015, and then also November. So it was a quarterly recurring for that journal. Once I'm here and looking at it, I can go ahead and print any of the specific journals that I want. But it is allowing me to go ahead and find that 3456 for several years. And as I mentioned, when I first pulled it up, it went ahead and pulled up the last one, the newest journal entry, because it's assuming that's the one that I want to look at. So if it were a different journal entry, so something that didn't have a recurring, so let's say this 3413, it would know when I put it in what year that that journal was for and it would automatically pull it up. And then one of the other changes that I mentioned was in purchasing. And we now have the ability to edit some of the transactional information. So when I go to edit transaction, and I pull up a vendor and I pull up a particular invoice, you'll see that on this invoice I can go ahead and change the remit to information. So if I had another address, I could go ahead and select that address so that when that payables transaction was paid, it would know the right address to go to. It also knows that if I pull up a vendor and I pull up an invoice that has been partially paid, that this remit to ID is grayed out. And if I zoom down and find that originating transaction, I can see that there's been a payment applied. So even though there is an amount remaining, it knows that I cannot change because I am, I've already paid part of it. You don't want somebody going in and creating a check to themselves and then creating a different address. So then you would never know that that had happened. The other thing that you can do is edit transaction information on the 1099. 
So if I pull up one of my 1099 vendors, you'll see that I can click on a particular voucher. I can change the type of 1099 that it was. I can make a particular transaction, not a 1099 transaction, and I can change the 1099 amount. So perhaps on this transaction, there wasn't a full amount that should have gone towards that. I can then hit process and I get an audit report of the changes that I've made. The system will know that it's not applicable to have this transaction with that 1099. Now, fixed assets has had really no major modifications in the last couple of releases. So in this release, there are some extensive modifications. The ones that I think are very helpful are the ones I've underlined here. So you're able to get historical depreciation reports and say, as of a particular date, let me see what the depreciation was. And the process progress bars actually indicate the amount of processing that has happened and the amount left to be done. There's a mass depreciation reversal option instead of having to do one at a time. In the past, that's what the case was. There's an auto-generate next asset ID number with an area that you can set up your next numerical asset ID. There's an ability to look at fixed asset transactions in batches prior to posting to the general ledger. And further to that, you're able to post in detail to the general ledger. Prior to this, it was only in a summary mode. Now again, there's some of these other ones that are great. They're, they're wonderful enhancements also, just not as, um, I'm just not as excited about those as some of the other ones. So the, the auto-generate next asset ID number, you would just go under Setup Fixed Assets and Company, click on this little checkbox and put what your next asset ID is going to be, and then it would increment by one from there. In the Fixed Asset Depreciation Report area, you could pull up this report, you could include active, retired, partial, open assets, and depreciation as of a particular date, and even display the reset amounts. So again, some pretty extensive changes in the ability to look at an appreciation as of a date. So as I mentioned in the past that you were posting in summary, this is now going to allow you to post in detail and also give you a process of kind of putting them into batches that you want to control and then have it here for your review before you actually post it. Prior to this, it would just create the batch and have it out there ready to post in the general ledger. It didn't allow you to specify exactly which assets you wanted to include. As I mentioned, you're now able to reverse depreciation on more than one asset as, at a time. So just as you can select to depreciate, you can also reverse depreciation with those same options. It's just another checkbox on the screen. So there are some additional flexibilities with the formats in the eReconcile program. There have been multiple changes in the encumbrance management module. In receivables, there are some great new features to allow flexibility with the addresses, and I'll be showing you that in the next screen. There's also that much anticipated um, ability to have multi-currency applications and cash entry, but now you're able to have multi-currency in your application of cash. You can actually email out your statements and you can use those as in the Word New Word templates. You also have the ability to save different sorting for customers and vendors. Now I'm not going to show you all of those features, but I am going to show you that in your receivable setup screen in GP, you now have these options to say for my customer addresses, I'm going to have some additional fields that I want to have the values for and these are the name of the field. So here in my address window, I now have these two extra fields that I can have set up. In inventory, there have been multiple enhancements made. Um, some of the ones that are again my favorites is this multiple serial number select option instead of one at a time and also reason codes for making stock movement and adjustments. In sales order processing and manufacturing, you now have some additional templates for your documents in sales order processing. So when you're printing, there are some additional layouts that you can choose from. 
Um, one of my favorites is having the ship to address that has a different company name. You were able to ship somewhere else, but you had to have it say the original name and there wasn't room for a name of a company and it just didn't make sense to me that if I'm going to ship somewhere else, it's not, possibly it's not my company that I'm shipping to. And then further integration into the analytical accounting series. Purchase order processing. Now, one of the things that people have been looking into is the ability to attach documents specifically for payables and purchase order processing. This is not a fully um, integrated document management module, but it does allow you to scan a document, save it to your workstation in a particular folder, and then if you say, when I'm in my purchase order, attach a document, it will look in that area and you're able to then attach that scanned document. So it's not completely automated, but it does allow you to attach a document that then would be moved from your purchase order into your invoice and have that history of what the documents look like. You can also choose that when you print a purchase order that you want that purchase order printing to be kept in a place that then you can attach the actual copy of the purchase order that you printed to the purchase order itself. Some of the other big changes is just a further integration with um, analytical accounting and the option to prevent your purchase orders from being closed prior to the action of the matching happening. Field service, again, is an area that hasn't had a lot of extensive enhancements or features added in the last couple of releases, so there have been quite a number of them, and we'll be happy to go over those in particular with you if you use field service. There have been some great additions in payroll, and um, really the, the big thing is the check build exception report, that you can run this and it'll actually notify you if there are some areas that you need to look at prior to trying to build your printing. Um, there's also some ability to edit some history in, with your pay codes. Human resources, there are several small changes to that and I'm just going to let you read through that list. One of the major changes with human resources is now that whole area of requisitions is available in the navigation list area that has not been available in the past. With email, we know that people wanted a 64-bit supported Outlook integration. That's now true. You can also, from all the navigation lists, so if you're looking at sales documents or purchasing documents, you can see whether something has been emailed out to that customer or that vendor. There is also some additional capabilities I mentioned before about the receivable statements. Um, but the ability to use those word templates in your emails. Same thing with just SOP in general, that we have a lot more word templates that are available. So these were just a quick flyby of really over 125 features that were added to the system, along with things like the whole web client and management reporter, and the ability for users to manipulate their home pages. So quite extensive list of features. So I do encourage you to take a look at some of these features um, more in depth. As I mentioned in the beginning, there is a feature of the day that Microsoft puts out. And we are also putting out small little YouTube videos for our clients so that they can see all of these individual enhancements at a minute or two at a time. Along with just our YouTube videos, we are out there on Twitter and Facebook and, and LinkedIn. We have several blogs that we communicate to our clients with. And so I would encourage you to contact us for more of that information or just look out in the internet for us. Now our next Collins Computing webcast for our clients is scheduled for Thursday, December 6th. We will go be going over the year-end closing for Microsoft Dynamics GP. We'll talk about all of the various modules and what you need to do in them for closing. We'll give you some steps to doing your year-end closing and also some tricks that we've learned along the years. The following one is a webcast about the GP User Group Summit that we attended in October and some of our favorite tips and tricks and sessions that we attended so we can share that information with our customers. And then one of the first webcasts that we'll be having in the new year 
is a solution by one of our partners and it's called the Data Safe Online Backup Solution. If there is a webcast that you're very interested in seeing, I would encourage you to email me so that I can go ahead and provide that to you as our client base, whether it's a particular module, some processes, a particular topic that you wanted to discuss. And that's it. We're going to open this up for questions, or, or if you're watching a tape recording of this, I'd encourage you to email agelman at collinscomputing.com, and I will answer any of your questions. Thank you so much for attending.